CS 407 Numerical Analysis, Section 6.1. First degree and second degree splines. We'll begin with a little bit of motivation. And in this hypothetical scenario, engineers construct an airfoil by experimentation in a wind tunnel and then draw a cross section as a curve on coordinate paper. Now, to study this by analytical methods, you need to have a formula. And to get that formula, what you need is the coordinates for a finite set of points. And then you can construct a cubic interpolating spline curve to match these points. We'll discuss general polynomial spline functions and how they can be used in various numerical problems such as data fitting, uh, which is uh, the type of problem we just described. So a brief history of uh, these splines, they're rooted in the work of draftsmen and dr people who were drawing um, drawing back in the uh, 1800s needed to draw a gently turning curve between points. The process was called fairing. <coughs> and fairing can be accomplished with a couple different tools. One is with French curve and the second is with long strips of wood passing through control points by weights laid down on draftsman's table and attached to strips. The weights were called ducks and the strips of wood were called splines. Let's take a look at these. Here's a uh, traditional spline. This comes from uh, the Wikimedia Foundation. And what you see here is you see elastic uh, nature of the wooden strips. And you can bend these a little bit while still passing through the prescribed points. The wood, basically what it does is it solves a differential equation and minimizes the strain energy as part of the uh, curve. So this is a symbol function of curvature, and the mathematical theory of these curves owes much to early investigators, uh, particularly Schoenberg in the 1940s and 50s. The other tool for this are the uh, French curves. Uh, and again, these come from your uh, mostly correct but occasionally drunk friends over at Wikimedia. Uh, this set of three is the most common set. Um, these are known as the Burmeister set. Now the uh, one on the far left is most commonly used for hyper, uh, hyperbolas. Uh, the smaller one on the right is used for ellipses, and the large one is used mostly for parabolas. By the way, the first book giving a systemic exposition on spline theory wasn't published until 1967. So the mathematics of this are relatively new, despite splines being in common use during the 19th century. So a spline function is a function that consists of polynomial pieces joined together with a certain smoothness conditions. Uh, a simple example is the polygonal function or a spline of degree one whose pieces are linear polynomials joined together to achieve continuity, as you see in the figure below. The points t0, t1, through tn, at which the function changes its character, are termed knots. Thus the spline function in the figure has eight knots. You can see where the function changes its character. These are the knots. So when they're defined in explicit terms, we write the function for the spline as follows. Basically, this is a piecewise linear function where each piece s of x is a linear polynomial. Now, if the knots t0, t1, through tn are given, and if we have the a sub i and b sub i coefficients, then we can evaluate s of x at any x. Basically determine the interval that contains it, which one of these intervals contains it, and then use the appropriate linear function for that interval. So let's take a look at the formal definition of a degree one spline. If the function s defined by a piecewise linear function is continuous, we call it a first degree spline. Function s is called a spline of degree one if the domain of s is in the interval a, b, s is continuous on that interval, and there's a partitioning of it such that s is a linear polynomial on each subinterval. Outside of a, b, we define the function to be s0 of x, the first one, when x is less than a, and sm minus 1 of x when x is greater than b, the last point. <clears throat> The continuity of a function f at a point s is defined by taking the limit of the left hand side and seeing if it's equal to the limit at the right hand side. So basically we need the function to be continuous. Here's an example. Let's take a look at this function. Now this one is actually piecewise and it's linear. 
and we want to see whether it's a first degree spline function. Well, it is piecewise linear, but it's not a spline because it's discontinuous at x equals zero. In particular, if we take the left and right side, hand side limits of the function f of x, on the left side we get one. That's the limit is of one minus x as x goes to zero, and that's equal to one. And if we take it from the positive side, it's limit as x goes to zero plus of f of x, which is the limit as x goes to zero of x, which is equal to zero. So the spline function of degree one can be used for interpolation, that is to fit through the points on a uh, hypothetical graph. Uh, suppose we have the following table of function values. Now you've seen these back in chapter four. Um, there's no loss of generality in supposing that t0 is less than t1 is less than tn. Basically we can uh, put the uh, t sub i points in order, and then it's only a matter of labeling the knots. The table can then be represented by a set of n plus one points, ti, yi, in the plane, and these points have distinct x, y coordinates. We can draw a, poly a polygonal line through the, all the points without drawing a vertical segment, because again, those are not equal which ends up being the graph of a function and it's also a spline of degree one. Now, let's take a look at those line segments. We can use the point slope form of a line to derive s sub i of x is equal to y sub i plus m i times x minus t i on the interval t i to t i plus one and m sub i is the slope of the line and it's given by m sub i is y i plus one minus y i divided by t i plus one minus t i. That should be familiar from high school uh, geometry. At the end of this, we end up with two n parameters to create all the equations s sub i. And we need two n conditions in order to interpolate the function. So what we have is the number of parameters equals the number of conditions for the first degree splines. For higher degree splines, we shall encounter a mismatch in the two numbers. Spline to degree k will have k minus one free parameters for us to use as we wish in the problem of interpolating at the knots. The form of the equation in the first sub-bullet is better than that of the general slope intercept form shown in the last sub-bullet for practical evaluation purposes. This is because some of the quantities x minus ti must be computed in any case simply to determine which subinterval contains x. Now let's take a look at how we can actually code this up. So here's a piece of pseudocode that does a spline of uh, degree 1. The following is a function procedure and it uses n minus n plus one table values, t sub i, y sub i, in linear arrays t i and y i. And we assume that a is equal to t zero, which is less than t one, which is less than t n, and t sub n is equal to b. Now given the next value, the routine returns s of x using piecewise linear spline function and the point slope form of the appropriate segment. As before, we use the first segment if x is less than t sub 0, and last segment if x is greater than t sub n. To assess the goodness of fit when we interpolate a function with the first degree spline, it's useful to have something called the modulus of continuity of a function f. Now, suppose f is defined on the interval a, b. The modulus of continuity of f is omega f semicolon h, which is the supremum of f u minus f v, where uh, u and v lie between a and b, and u is less than b, and the absolute value of u minus v is less than h. Now, the supremum is the least upper bound of a given set of real numbers. And the quantity omega f h measures how much f can change over small interval of width h. If f is continuous on a, b, then it's uniformly continuous, and omega fh will tend to zero as h tends to zero. If f is not continuous, omega fh will not tend towards zero. So if f is differentiable on a, b, in addition to being continuous on a, b, and if f prime is bounded on a, b, then we can use the mean value theorem to get an estimate of the modulus of continuity. 
See, two theorems that relate to the accuracy of first-degree polynomials and splines. These are the uh, two accuracy theorems, and theorem one is the first-degree polynomial accuracy theorem. From the basic result, one can easily prove the following one simply by applying the basic inequality on each subinterval. The first theorem tells us that if more knots are inserted in a way that will that the maximum spacing uh, of h goes to zero, then the corresponding first degree spline will converge uniformly to f. Now that's a good result. Recall that this type of result is conspicuously lacking in polynomial interpolation, where the degree of the polynomial gets higher and higher and we get more fluctuations. In the case of polynomial interpolation, raising the degree and making the nodes fill up on the interval will not necessarily ensure the convergence takes place for an arbitrary continuous function. Now let's take a look at second degree splines. Splines of degree higher than one are a bit more complicated. And we're now going to take a look at quadratic splines. So we'll use letter Q to remind ourselves that we're considering piecewise quadratic functions. Function Q is a second degree quadratic spline if it has the following properties. The domain of Q is an interval AB. Q and Q prime are continuous on this interval AB. And there are points T sub i called knots, such that A is equal to T0, which is less than T1, less than T2, all the way to Tn, and Tn is equal to B. And Q is a polynomial of degree at most 2 on each subinterval. In brief, a quadratic spline is a continuously differentiable piecewise quadratic function, where quadratic includes all linear combinations of the basic monomial functions up to 2, in other words, 1x and x squared. Let's take a look at an example. Okay, so is the following a quadratic spline? Well, we see that those functions are no higher than um, quadratic, but what we need to do is we need to check the continuity, and basically we'll need the right and left limits of the functions and their derivatives. So, what we can do is we can determine whether q and q prime are continuous at the interior knots, which are those um, four different limits there. We match up q uh, at 0, q at 1, q prime at 0, and q prime at 1. And the left and right limits match up here, so q of x is a quadratic spline. Quadratic splines are not actually used in applications as often as natural cubic splines, which we develop in the next section. However, the derivation of interpolating quadratic and cubic splines are similar enough that an understanding of the simpler second-degree spline theory will allow us to grasp more easily the complicated third-degree spline theory that we'll see in section 6.2. Discussion here is provided only as means of preparation for the study of these higher-order splines, which are the ones we use in a lot of applications. So, suppose that we have a table of values. This should look familiar from interpolation theory and the first order splines. And assume that the points T0, T1, Tn, which we think of as nodes for the interpolation problem, are also the knots of the spline function to be constructed. Later, we'll do another quadratic spline interpolant in which the nodes for interpolation are different from the knots. Quadratic spline consists of n separate quadratic functions, x, which are quadratic, so you have a sub i x squared plus b i x plus c sub i, one for each subinterval created by the n plus one knot. So we actually have three n coefficients here. On each one of the intervals, t i to t i plus one, the quadratic spline function q i must satisfy the interpolation conditions q sub i ti is equal to y sub i, and qi ti plus 1 is equal to yi plus 1. So we have n sub intervals, so two n conditions. We also have n minus 1 more conditions related to the continuity of q prime at each of the interior knots. This gives us a total of 3n minus 1 conditions. So we're just one condition short of the magic 3n required to get our quadratic spline. There are a variety of different ways to impose this. One is q prime of t0 is equal to 0, or q double prime at 0 is equal to 0. Um, so here is our following piecewise quadratic function for the interpolating quadratic sprung. 
spline. The value q prime t0 is prescribed as our additional condition. q of x should be continuously differentiable on the entire interval. Interpolate the table so q of ti is equal to yi for i between 0 and n. Now, since q prime is continuous, we can put z sub i is equal to q prime ti. We'll eventually need to find the correct values for these z sub i, but we can give the general formula for q sub i at this point. Now, q sub i ti is equal to y i. Basically, at each one of the um, nodes that captures the value perfectly, q prime of t sub i is equal to z i, and q prime q i prime ti plus 1 is equal to z i plus 1. These three conditions define q sub i uniquely on ti, ti plus 1. Now for the quadratic spline function q to be continuous and to interpolate the table of data, it's necessary and sufficient that qi, ti plus 1 is equal to y, i plus 1, for i goes between 0 and n minus 1. When we write this out in detail and simplify, what we have is we have an equation for zi plus 1. Now basically what this equation can do is it can help us obtain that vector z, z0, z1, through zn transpose, starting with an arbitrary value for z0. Let's summarize things with an algorithmic description. So step one, determine the z0, z1, zn transpose by selecting z0 and computing z1, z2 through zn recursively using the formula. The quadratic spline interpolating the function q is then given by the formula underneath the second bullet. So here we construct the linear spline s and the quadratic spline q for the five data points 0, 8, 1, 12, 3, 2, 4, 6, 8, 0. Now if this looks familiar it's because we did this one actually back in section 4.2. The graph on the left hand side of this slide shows the first and second degree spline functions, while the graph on the right shows the interpolating polynomial functions from chapter 4. Notice that the spline functions actually give us a better fit for the type of curve we're desiring. Uh, the other thing to notice is that the scan is taken from the author slides. I find it interesting that they had to scan their own textbook in order to get that. Uh, finally, we'll take a look at uh, Subaton quadratic splines. This is a useful approximation and was uh, proposed by Subaton in 1967. It's interpolation with quadratic splines. The nodes for interpolation are chosen to be the first and last knots and the midpoints between knots. Remember that the knots are defined as the point where the spline function is permitted to change in form from one polynomial to another. The nodes are the points where the values of the spline are specified. So there's a slight difference between knots and nodes. Um, there are two n plus one interpolation conditions and two n minus one conditions for the continuity of q and q prime for a total of three n. The author is given an outline of the theory and how to find the midpoints, the form of the segments, and how to solve the associated tridiagonal tri system for the z sub i. After finding all the z i, we can compute qx and suitable code can be written to carry out the interpolation method. The entire process is summarized quite nicely in one rather large bullet on page 261. Next time we'll look at natural cubic splines.